Bible with you, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. So far we have looked at three men mentioned in this passage. We've looked at Abel, we've looked at Enoch, and last week Rob helped us to look at Noah. Today we're going to be looking at a man who is credited as being the father of the faith, Abraham, an adventurer and friend of God. Now throughout Hebrews, what we need to keep in mind is the aim of Hebrews is to encourage and strengthen a church that has become discouraged. Encourage them to stand firm in the midst of persecution and in the midst of suffering. Hebrews is written with a, a focus on Christ's superiority, a message, a fact that would help these early believers to stand strong, help them to hold on with a stability and assurance, to keep trusting Jesus even when discouraging situations were happening around them. It's with this understanding then that we read Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. This understanding of giving the people an assurance is reinforced in, in some translations of this verse. Where it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance points towards a structure and under a structure. A structure that is unseen, that makes a solid foundation for a house above the surface to stand firm no matter what comes its way. Even if the earth is shaking, the substance, the substructure is there in order to make the structure firm. That is what faith does. Faith helps us to keep standing no matter what comes our way. It's with this understanding that we talk about faith today then. Faith is not just believing that something good is going to happen. It's not an optimism about the future. Rather, faith has an assurance and a stability because it has God as its object. Not our desires, but God as the object of faith. We've been talking in past weeks, and I'll bring it up again just quickly, about what it is that faith does. So what does faith do? Well, faith, first of all, makes a future hope a present reality. Faith makes a future hope a present reality. It takes those hopes that we're looking forward to in the future and gives us an assurance that in God's time and in God's way, it will happen. Faith also causes our soul to see what our eyes cannot. We cannot see God, but we can see Him at work. Our soul is able to see what God is doing, even when our eyes cannot. Our soul is able to grab a hold of the promises of God. And even when our eyes cannot see evidences along the way, our soul can see them and act in faith accordingly. Faith is what God uses to bring us an assurance and a conviction to know that He is in control and that He is worthy of me putting my whole trust in Him, no matter what the outcome might be. And then it's out of this assurance that I can act in confidence, knowing that God is in control. I can be a person of faith. Martin Luther describes faith like this. Faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace, so certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting Him. Such confidence and knowledge of God's grace makes you happy, joyful, and bold in your relationship to God and all creatures. Look at Luther's words for a couple of minutes. First, Luther says it is living. Faith is living. It's alive. It's not a once and done believing, but rather it is something that grows. It's a living, bold trust in God's grace. Not simply believing or hoping or being optimistic or being positive. No, faith is a bold trust in what? In God's grace. It is so certain of God's faith. There's not a second guessing of God's favor and His grace that was poured out in Jesus Christ, but rather it's this foundation of God's favor 
for us because of what Jesus has done that we build faith on. This gives us the assurance, and this and only this, not our performance, not our actions, not trying to do a good enough job to win his approval. No, the assurance is in being certain of his favor given to us in Jesus Christ. So certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting him. Luther points to faith requiring an action of risking. Faith is not just holding out for God to do what I want him to do. But rather, faith is willing to risk it all. Because I am certain of God's faith. Therefore, I'm willing to risk my safety and my security and my success because of Him. Then Luther points to the result of this kind of faith. It makes you happy, joyful, and bold in relationship to God and all creatures. The result of faith is not that I find comfort or I find security or I find success or I find riches or I find health. It's in none of that. The result of faith is that because of a confidence in God's grace, I become happy, joyful, and bold in relationship to all. This raises a question before we look at Abraham's faith, a, a moment of self-reflection. How bold is my trust in Jesus today? How bold is my faith in Jesus, my trust in Jesus this morning? Do I have this kind of confidence that Luther speaks of? Do I have a bold trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross for me? Am I certain of God's favor? So certain that I would risk death a thousand times over? Am I so confident in Him that my life is marked by being happy, joyful, and bold in relationship to God and to all creatures? Is that me this morning? Because this is the foundation, this is the substructure, this is the substance on which we build this assurance, this confidence that we have in God's grace that would be willing to lay it all on the line. This morning, have you put your trust in Jesus Christ, the bold trust that would be marked by Luther's words? Now, as you continue to reflect on that, let's look at Abraham. Many of us relate to Abraham. We sense a call from God somewhere along the line that we responded to. Perhaps you sense a call from God to, to step out into a certain area of ministry. Perhaps you sense a call from God to, to move to Ethiopia. Perhaps you sense a call from God to move from the countryside into Addis. Perhaps you sense a call from God to start a a new business that would transform society. Perhaps you sense the call from God to serve in some area. But then as you walk down the road, things started to look much differently than what you had first anticipated. How do we, like Abraham, respond to God in faith when results look much different than the hope that we have? Let's read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 19, and look at Abraham through the eyes of the writer of Hebrews. Starting at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. 
Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. For us here, Abraham redefines what trust in God looks like. His story recalibrates us. It causes us to examine our own lives and what we call acting in faith. His story challenges us to consider how life might look different if we were willing to be an adventurer, to step out in faith, if we lived differently. His story awakens us out of life as usual and as normal, and again calls us to be an adventurer and friend of God, as Abraham was. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Abraham's faith draws us from life as usual to be willing to step into the unknown. God calls Abraham to leave his home, his family, his family's gods, his inheritance, his homeland, all that he knew. And to go to an unknown place that God said he would tell him when he knew he had arrived in the right place. He didn't have much information to step out of But he went. That is faith. Abraham exhibited a trust in God because he knew that God was holding him. He risked not in a naive way, but rather in a way that he knew that God was calling him. He knew God's promises, and he knew that God would hold him, whatever the journey looked like. Now, Abraham would have his times of wavering along the way. He had times where he lacked trust, times where he disobeyed, times where he disbelieved, disbelieved God. Yet he is given to us as a model of what a radical faith looks like. God uses Abraham's example to call you and I to have our idea of faith re-examined, to have it recalibrated, to be willing to have our trust increased to where we're willing to say, I will go anywhere, I will do anything, because you are the God who is faithful. Let's look at five things that Abraham, five ideas that we see in Abraham's story about living out a radical faith. First, look at Hebrews 11, verse 8 again. It's worth reading again. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Abraham's trust in God left, led him to a simple, dependent obedience. Abraham's trust, his faith, led him to simply put one foot in front of the other, even though he didn't know where he was going, to keep taking a step. Simple obedience. The writer of Hebrews simply says, Abraham obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. Now this can be hard for us to imagine. The planners among us want to know where we're going, right? Where's the destination? How are we going to track how far along the journey we are? We want to know what's going to be there when we arrive. Even before we risk, we want to know, well, is this going to be a place where I get more comfort than what I had before? Because if I don't get more comfort, then it's not worth me risking to get there. Or we want to know, is by stepping out, is this the time when people are finally going to recognize me as a successful human being? And if not, then I don't want to risk stepping out. But Abraham shows us a simple, dependent obedience, even when he didn't know where he was going. He was outside of his abilities and his capacities. He only had God to lean on, and he could only put one foot in front of the other, making one statement of faith after another, in simple, dependent obedience. Consider our faith today. <clears throat> 
Imagine the transformation if we lived a radical faith like Abraham when it came to the way we read God's word. Imagine taking John 13, Jesus' commandment to us. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What if we took those words of Jesus and we lived those out in simple, dependent obedience? We were willing to love someone even if they weren't giving us any love in return. We were willing to love someone even if it meant that we would never even get noticed. We were willing to love someone even if it meant it would cost us everything. That is one foot in front of the other. A simple, dependent obedience transforms the way we read the scriptures and the way we say yes to Jesus. So the first ingredient of a radical faith is a simple, dependent obedience. Now let's look at verses 9 through 10. By faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Read the writer's words about how Abraham lived. It doesn't sound very comfortable, does it? Not at all. I believe the second ingredient of a radical faith is don't expect to get too comfortable here. Don't expect to get too comfortable here. Abraham lived like a stranger in a foreign country, having left his family and the familiar to live the rest of his life in a new home. He lived in tents, as did his children. He never laid the foundation for a house, nor did he ever build a city. He lived in temporary housing, moving from place to place, yet he held on to the future hope, the city built by God, the city where God dwells. Abraham's comfort was not in settling down in this life in any way. His comfort was in the future hope of the eternal city where he would live in God's presence. But this is something that plagues us all over the world as believers in Jesus Christ. We desire making our home here too comfortable. Materialism, consumerism, success, climbing the corporate ladder, prestige, a quest for security, a self-centeredness where it's all about me, a quest to make myself somebody. All I want is, can somebody please give me some comfort? And it plagues us. We can become too focused on making this our home when we are meant to be strangers and aliens and pilgrims who are just passing through, living here while looking forward to our eternal home. The truth is, Many of us start out risking, but along the way we choose to settle down. We start out hearing the call of God and we lay it all on the line, but along the way, after taking those first steps, comfort begins to call to us and we stop risking. Thomas Merton, the Trappist tra tra monk, once said, to hope is to risk frustration. Therefore, make up your mind to risk frustration. That is the life of faith. Making up our minds to risk frustration, to push comfort aside, to be willing to step out in faith. Abraham, the most famous man of faith, his focus was living, it was on living as a stranger while trusting in his God. He models for us that a radical faith is not interested in becoming too comfortable here because we're just passing through. We are pilgrims on our way to the city of God. May we give up our quest for comfort and lean on Jesus as the only foundation for our faith and our trust and our joy. A radical faith, well, a simple dependent obedience, it doesn't expect to... It, doesn't expect to get too comfortable here. Now we'll read verses 11 through 12. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, 
was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Abraham trusted God for God-sized results. A call to trust God for God-sized results. A radical faith will trust God to move. A common prayer among those who have a radical faith is, God, if you don't move, we are sunk. God, if you don't move, we are dead. God, if you don't move, we are done. God, if you don't move, we are finished. Oh God, oh God, oh God. It's the cry of desperation because without him moving, it's not going to happen. Abraham had a problem that there was no way he could solve. There was a promise that Abraham would father the nations, yet now he was old, and Sarah was old, and Sarah was barren, unable to have any children. Sarah tried to take this home into her own hands and see a child born to Abraham through Hagar, the servant. But that disobedience would cost them in the end. Abraham was in a situation that if God's promise was going to be fulfilled, it could only be for God saving the day. Even when the news came to Abraham and Sarah that they were pregnant, they could not believe it. Both of them laughed in disbelief that God was pulling this promise off somehow. But the writer is always pointing towards God being the actor here. Abraham considered God faithful. God made the promise. God would bring a God-sized miraculous solution. And he did. You and I, we can push off those impossible dreams that God has given us. Because we know that we can't accomplish it. And that's the point. A God dream will point us towards dependency on Him. It will make us pray prayers like, God, if you don't move, we are sunk. We are dead. We are done. We are finished. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I am over my head unless you move. We often look for man-sized results, though. Isn't it great that God has given us a human capacity to solve problems, to use our minds, to use our hands, to work? Yet at times, it will only be God who rescues the day. Do you and I consider God to be faithful to His promises? Can we trust God to move and bring His results that will bring Him glory and bring Him fame? Because the impossible surrounds us. The barren, the too old, the promise of a dream that seems dead, the impenetrable wall that we can't push through. Can you and I again trust God to be faithful to His promises? Because it's in this trust that we experience friendship with God. We draw close to Him. We experience a dependency with the, on the living God. And that is where He meets us as a friend, as He did with Abraham. A radical faith means a simple, dependent obedience. Doesn't expect too much comfort. Trust God to save the day. Now verses 13 to 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. It's a call to redefine success in the journey. Redefine success in the journey. The writer of Hebrews directs us back to considering Abel, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. All of them saw the future hope, but they never experienced it in the present. They never got the promise. Faith led them to a deep dependency on God. They were propelled to trust Him, to see a difference in their generation, but especially in the generations to come. Yet the rewards were never theirs in this life. Their success was in their journeys. 
They, like Abraham, were pilgrims in this life, trusting God for today and for the future hope. They did not settle down here, but rather they were looking forward to that eternal city, that heavenly home that God was preparing for them. And then verse 15 points to an important idea here. We read, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. At any point in time, these men could have gone back to life as normal. They could have returned back to their family, to their idols, to their culture. They could have returned back to what felt comfortable. They could have stopped looking so weird by believing in this God who was invisible. They could have stopped looking so strange by holding on to these promises that God had given them. Think about Abraham for a moment. A man who would father nations, but yet still remains childless. Imagine how much ridicule you face for holding on to a promise like that. At any point in time, they could have left that and gone back to comfort. They could have began to focus on getting what they wanted now. Satisfying every desire now. Satisfying every lust now. Satisfying every impulse. Getting everything they wanted in the here and now. Yet they kept looking forward. Their success was not in arriving. Their success was in the journey. You and I are on this journey too. God's desire is for us to walk with Him, to focus on Him, to keep Him as our treasure, our reward, our joy. He has prepared a true home for us, and we will never arrive in it in this life. May we keep focused on Him as our treasure on the journey until we arrive in His eternal presence. And whatever it is that keeps calling us back to satisfy our cravings, our desires, to make ourselves comfortable in the present, may we push those off. May we refuse to turn back. And may we stay focused on the journey, pressing forward towards Jesus until we arrive with Him. A radical faith requires a simple dependent obedience, doesn't expect too much comfort. Trust God for saving the day, redefine success in the journey. One final idea. Verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He would receive the promises, was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. To call to surrender everything back to Jesus again. Everything back to Jesus again. Imagine being Abraham. You hold the promise in your hands. God has met you in the journey. He has brought about a God-sized result. The miraculous has occurred and now you have a child. The promise. And now God calls Abraham to surrender this dream, this promise, back to him once again. Abraham has waited for this son for decades. And now he's being called to offer him as a sacrifice. What would you do? What a confusing time, right? But God, this is the dream you gave me. God, this is the provision. It's right in my hands. God, you're breaking through. And now you want me to sacrifice this to you? The promise? The dream? This makes no sense at all. But Abraham surrendered Isaac. Imagine. Look at Abraham's reasoning for a second. Even if God takes Isaac as a sacrifice, he can raise him back from the dead. That is faith. Chances are Abraham had never seen anything raised from the dead before. Yet his faith and trust was that God had made the promise, God will stay faithful to him. Even if he takes Isaac's life, he will raise him back from the dead. He has the capacity. Abraham knew that God would be glorified in the end. 
And what it meant of him was to surrender it all back to him. Because God would win. That is trust. That is faith. Faith has the bold trust to lay anything and everything that is important to us in surrender to God again to have his way. Dreams, promises, hopes, plans, desires, family, friends, ministries, NGOs, jobs, corporations, churches, all of it laid out like this in surrender as Abraham did as an act of faith and trust, may we do the same. Even if God is bringing great success in whatever you're putting your hands to, it's time to lay it down and surrender before Him again. Give it back to Him for Him to have His way. Isaac was the promise received by Abraham that Abraham surrendered to God. This morning, what do you and I need to lay down and surrender to Jesus? John Bunyan, in the year 1657, was sentenced to serve 12 years in prison. His crime was he was preaching. Here's what he writes about his surrendering time. He says, I found myself a man encompassed with infirmities. The parting with my wife and children hath often been to me in this place as the pooling of the flesh from my bones. And that not only because I am somewhat too fond of these mercies, but also because I should have brought to mind the many hardships, miseries, and wants that my poor family was likewise to meet with. Especially my poor blind child who lay nearer to my heart than all I had beside. All the thought of the hardships I thought my blind one might go under, would break my heart to pieces. Poor child, thought I, what sorrow art thou like to have for thy portion in this world? Thou must be beaten, must beg, suffer hunger, cold, nakedness, and a thousand calamities, though I cannot now endure that the wind shall blow upon thee. But yet recalling myself, thought I, I must venture to all with God, though it goes to the quick to me. John Bunyan faced with losing his freedom, losing his career, losing his possessions, losing all that was important to him, losing his family. And in a moment of needing to surrender it all back to God as an act of faith. Abraham, the one who walked out a radical faith that causes us to recalibrate to look at our lives and say, it's time to break out of the usual. It's time to risk again. It's time to be a people of faith. Let's stand together. This morning, do we trust Jesus with a bold trust? What is the step of trust that we'll take today? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for giving yourself while we were still enemies of God. Thank you for laying yourself down so that we could have life. And now, Jesus, I pray as a people of faith, the people who put our trust in you, help us to walk out a radical. Help us to walk out a radical trust. Help us to look at, at Abraham and to see the level of trust that he had for you. And may it cause us to look at our lives and be called forward in our trust in you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to do a deep work within us today. Call us forward into a radical faith, I pray.